Well, that's a long passage, but it's important for us to get an overview of it, and I hope we may be able to see at least the general message of this section of the prophecy of Isaiah. From chapter 9, verse 8, right through to chapter 10, verse 4, from where we began to read this evening, Isaiah has been returning to the immediate situation that the people of Israel face after the messianic prophecy which we studied in fair detail uh, in chapter 9 where the passage we often read at Christmas tells us that God's ultimate answer to all the disobedience and rebellion of his people God's ultimate answer to sin in the world God's ultimate answer to all the confusion and ruin that sin has brought in its wake is to be found in the child who will be born and who will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So through that whole section he is speaking about the ultimate answer God has for all the tragedy that sin has wrought. But now he turns to the more immediate future. And from chapter 9, verse 8, to chapter 10, verse 4, Isaiah turns to the people of Judah to tell them how the anger of God has been turned upon his own people. And we discovered when we were looking at that section that there are four things in chapter 9, verse 8, to 10, 4, which draw out God's anger in every generation. And we were facing the reality that we do need to face, in Isaiah particularly, that God is a God who reveals anger in Scripture. I was suggesting when we were looking at that that you really do discover a great deal about anybody if you ask what it is that makes them angry. There is such a thing as righteous anger, you know. It is not all anger that is wrong in Scripture. The Bible says, be angry and do not sin. And you discover so much about someone if you find out what it is that really makes them angry. For example, the thing that made Jesus angry was that his Father's honor and glory in the temple was being dragged down into the world of commercial dealing and human aggrandizement and greed. And it's a very telling thing to ask, what is it that really gets my dander up, as we say? What are the things that really upset me? What are the things that really grieve me? Are they things that really uh, just affect my own pride and my self-importance? Is that the thing that cuts me most? Or do I find that there are certain things about the honor of the name of the Lord my God which really cut me deepest to the quick? Here is Isaiah telling us there are four things that have drawn down God's anger upon Judah. Pride is the first of them in verses 8 to 12 of chapter 9. Misleading leaders is the second in verses 13 to 17. The elders and prominent men are the head. The prophets who teach lies are the tail. And he's speaking about the misleading leaders that Judah has had. Ruthless greed is the third in verses 18 to 21, where he tells us that Wickedness burns like a fire. By the wrath of the Lord, the land will be scorched. Because, verse 20, on the right they will devour but still be hungry. On the left they will eat but not be satisfied. There is this picture of the ruthless greed of those against whom God's anger is turned. And in chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, injustice. Now, in chapter 10, verse 3, one of the central things that Isaiah confronts them with is that there is going to be a day of reckoning. And he asks in verse 3, What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes 
from afar. And we need to live in the light of that all the time, that there is a day of reckoning for individuals, for a nation like Judah, and we'll find this evening for a nation like Assyria, for the whole race, there is a day of reckoning. And the great issue Isaiah presents them with, and the prophets do it regularly, is what will you do on the day of reckoning? Judah had been so privileged. They had had from God so many favors, and they had still turned their back upon him. And Isaiah asked them, what will you do on the day of reckoning? Now, God's reckoning was to produce judgment upon Judah, as we've been discovering again and again as we have gone through this part of Isaiah. But the instrument of his judgment was the land of Assyria. If you've been with us long through these weeks, you will remember that Judah's great sin was that instead of trusting the Lord and believing his word and casting in their lot with him, they had turned to this powerful nation and put their confidence in human power and human wisdom and ingenuity and cunning, and they had made an alliance. They had gone and got into an alliance with Assyria and began to believe that's where security was found. Now, you and I know that security for the people of God lies only in one thing, and that is putting their absolute confidence in the Lord their God. That's true for every generation and for every man and woman. But Judah put their confidence in human things, human resources, human power. And that very power of Assyria became the instrument of their own destruction as a nation by God. And of course the question that arises from verse 5 onwards is, how can God take up and use a pagan nation like Assyria? He is saying to them all the time, here is Assyria, and Assyria is going to be the instrument that I am going to use in order to judge this nation of Judah. If you can imagine uh, the situation being brought into nearer modern times, can you imagine God saying, here is Nazi Germany, and I am going to use Nazi Germany as an instrument of my purpose to destroy this nation which has rebelled against me. Because the question arises, how could God use such a pagan nation as this? Well, chapter 10, verses 5 to 34, really answers this question. And there is another question which needs to be answered, and that's taken up in this chapter as well. It is the question, what about God's own covenant people? What about the people he had chosen and called and bound himself to, and those who had responded to his grace and had bound themselves to him? What was to happen to this people? It turned out that they were far fewer than we would imagine. They were, in fact, a remnant. And if the males amongst us don't know what a remnant is, the ladies will certainly know what a remnant is. If you get a piece of cloth, you know, it's just a small part from the larger piece. It's a remnant, we say. Remnant sale I saw in a shop window in Toronto. I don't know what they were selling, but a remnant is a small part. And here we touch upon this whole truth that God has throughout history a remnant of his people. What's going to happen to his own people, to this remnant that he says he will preserve through all generations and all kinds of judgment? Well, Isaiah answers that question as well. And uh, there are throughout this chapter three truths which uh, we need to look at perhaps just to give us an idea of the ground that Isaiah is covering and what is not really a very easy part of the prophecy. 
Let me just spell out these three truths to you, first of all, from verse 5 onwards. The first truth is that God is not always on the side of the victors. Chapter 10, verse 5 reveals to us that God is turning upon Assyria. He says, Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger. Now, Assyria had come as the victorious nation, as that passage at the end of chapter 10 suggests, like a galloping army getting nearer and nearer to Jerusalem, and destruction seemed inevitable. And Assyria was the instrument of God's power. But one of the things this passage tells us is that God is not always on the side of the victors, that the strong armies are not always in God's favor, and God is not always on the side of those who win. That's one of the messages of this chapter. He is, in fact, actually against them, even though he is pleased to use them as an instrument of his purpose. Now, you notice he does that in verse 5. Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. So when you see evil triumph, you must not conclude that God approves of it and say, Because the doctrine of the sovereignty of God does not mean that whenever evil triumphs, God has done it in the sense that he approves of what evil men have done. So the first lesson of the chapter is that God is not always on the side of the victors. The second lesson is that defeat for us is not defeat for God. Now, that's the second lesson, and it's an equally important one. For example, chapter 10, verse 12, When the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say... Now, the work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem was to bring them defeat. And you find the people of God in a situation where they really are suffering the most appalling defeat and disaster. But defeat for us does not mean defeat for God, because God's purposes are marching on, as we shall see throughout the chapter. In chapter 10, verse 12, he says, when the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. And in verse 33 of the same chapter, See the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will lop off the boughs with great power, the lofty trees, a reference to the Assyrians, will be felled. The tall ones will be brought low. Now this is a testimony to the fact that even out of what seems the most appalling tragedy for God's people, God himself is being victorious. And the third great lesson of the chapter, therefore, is that God is sovereign, not only over his own people, but also over the godless. That is, he is sovereign over every nation and every area of the world. There is nothing outside of God's ultimate control. And that's one of the things that Isaiah is bringing before us in this whole chapter. The one thing that stands through the chapter is the testimony to God's sovereign control, not only over his own people, but over every nation, ultimately, throughout the whole earth. Now, these are three lessons that we really need 
to lift up out of this chapter and to take with us into our thinking about national and international situations, about the condition of the church in our own time, about God's ways in the world. And they are that God is sovereign over his own people and over the godless nations of the earth, that defeat for us is not defeat for God. We discover that out of the lopped trees, God is going to bring a shoot and a branch, a stump of Jesse, and that will be the Messiah. And that God is not always on the side of the victors. Now let's look more closely then for the rest of our time at the three sections into which chapter 10 divides itself. They are verses 5 to 19, and verses 20 to 27, and verses 28 to 34. Do you notice that each of these three sections has a refrain if you look at them closely? And the refrain in each case is exactly the same. It deals with the certainty of God's final triumph over the godless Assyrians. Verses 16 to 19, Therefore the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will send a wasting disease upon his sturdy warriors. The light of Israel will become a fire, their holy one a remnant, a flame, and so on. And it speaks about how God will triumph over the godless. The end of the second section in verses 26 and 27, the Lord Almighty will lash them with a whip as when he struck down Midian at the rock of Horeb, and he will raise his staff over the waters as he did in Egypt. Do you remember when God raised his staff over the waters at Egypt? Two things happened. One was that the Red Sea was cleft in two and the people of God went over. And the other thing was that the waters came down and engulfed the Egyptians and they were destroyed. And this is the reference here, that God is able to take the whole army of this mighty nation of Assyria and do with them as he did with the armies of Egypt in the days of Moses. Then in this last section, verses 33 and 34, See the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will lop off the boughs with great power. The lofty trees will be felled, the tall ones will be brought low. He will cut down the forest thickets with an axe. Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. So in these picturesque ways, God speaks about the way he is going to destroy the Assyrians. First, as a flame of fire and as a wasting disease in the first section. Secondly, as he did with the Egyptians, engulfing them with the rod of his power. And thirdly, as a forester would have gone through a forest and made the place totally devoid of trees, so God will lop them down. The first section Chapter 10, verses 5 to 19, deals with God's righteous judgment. The second, verses 20 to 27, deals with God's true remnant. And the third, verses 28 to 34, deals with God's final triumph. And we look at these three this evening. God's righteous judgment, chapter 10, verse 5 through to verse 19. And that deals with God's judgment on Assyria. Now, if you think back on the things that roused God's anger against Judah in chapter 9, you'll see the majority of them here in his anger against Assyria. And it's a very important thing for us to realize that God is not a God of partiality. He does not look upon his people and say, I hate pride and I hate misleading leaders and I hate injustice there, but I excuse it here. The thing that brings down God's judgment in the end of the day is always unrighteousness. Now, do you notice why he says he is going to judge Assyria in verse 12 of this chapter? Verse 12. 
when the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. Now, what Assyria demonstrates is this sense of self-centered, self-willed megalomania. By the strength, verse 13, of my hand, I have done this by my wisdom, because I have understanding. I removed the boundaries of the nations, and so on. And God says, because of their pride, and because of their self-will, and because of their egocentric lives, I will bring judgment upon them. Notice it's not only that they have pride, but they also have ruthless greed, which was another of the things God judged Judah for. Look at verse 13, halfway through. I plundered their treasures, Assyria is saying, like a mighty one, I subdued their kings. Then in verse 14, he uses this picturesque way of describing what Assyria has done, like somebody raiding a bird's nest, which has had eggs that are abandoned by the mother bird. As one reaches into a nest, so my hand reached for the wealth of the nations. As men gathered abandoned eggs, so I gathered all the countries. Not one flapped a wing or opened its mouth to chirp. Before me, Assyria is saying, none of these nations could possibly stand. My power was such that I overwhelmed them all. Do you see this boasting, self-centered spirit, which is motivated by ruthless greed? Now, God's judgment comes upon such a nation. And sometimes we are tempted to ask when we look historically at what is happening in the world round about us, you know? We can see often that the people of God are under discipline. But what about these godless nations? What about people who are described in this kind of chapter, who appear to be flouting the law of God and getting off with it? Well, what God is saying is, when I have finished the work that I am doing, then I will come down in judgment, and they will not escape. And God's judgment on Assyria in verses 16 to 19 is described in, true, in two metaphors. One is sickness, and the other is fire. Verse 16, I will send a wasting disease upon his sturdy warriors. Under his pomp, second half of verse 16, a fire will be kindled like a blazing flame, and the flame will be God himself coming down amongst them in a single day, it will burn and consume his thorns and briars, and then moves off into another uh, metaphor, the metaphor of a forest which is being destroyed, the splendor of his forests and fertile fields. It will completely destroy, as when a sick man wastes away. Now there is, in secular history, some suggestion that the nation of Assyria experienced precisely that kind of disaster amongst its troops and throughout its people, so that in the end of the day its army was reduced to the point where in verse 19 Isaiah says, the remaining trees of his forest will be so few that a child could write them down. That is, the might of Assyria was reduced to something that was almost comically small. Now this is God's righteous judgment. I think it's a very important thing for us to recognize as we look out at the world and as we look down through history and look at our own daily newspaper that the one thing that is going to be true, whatever else we may not know, is that God is not mocked.
never. And that the last word always belongs to God. That's the first section. The second section deals not only with, God, with God's righteous judgment, but with God's true remnant. And you'll notice how at the beginning of verse 20, Isaiah turns to this theme of the remnant of God's people. The question, you see, that arose was, is God in his wrath going to cut off his people altogether? Is he going to make an end of his grace? Is he coming and saying, mercy is ended, judgment is the only word? And Isaiah says, no, God will always have his people for this reason, that he has a work to do in the longer term, which he is going to give us a hint of at the beginning of chapter 11. And God is preserving his people, even in the darkest hour of history, God is preserving a remnant of his people. They may be very few, but God is preserving a remnant. Now, I don't know if some of you realize that uh, within living memory, certainly within my living memory, there was in Scotland a time when it would have been possible to become profoundly depressed because of the number of biblical evangelical causes that there were throughout our land. In the divinity faculties of the universities, for example, you could have counted probably on two hands the number of evangelical biblical students that there were. And people, I can remember in the earliest days of my Christian experience when I was coming up to 20, people being depressed and distressed about the barrenness of the land spiritually particularly in the Church of Scotland. And it's a very striking thing. I can remember it still, sitting in the manse of Springburn Hill, and Dr. Bill Fitch, who ministered in Knox Church in Toronto after he left Springburn Hill, saying to some of us regularly, and it was a word of real encouragement, I can remember, Never forget that God has his own cause nearer to his heart than you have. And he has a remnant of his people whom he will preserve. And that proved to be true. And you will know that whatever the future may hold for us, there has been a work of God's grace, certainly in the Church of Scotland, so that in this past week there were something like 200 evangelical ministers gathered at Creef. I wasn't there amongst them, but there was a great gathering of these men, and God has done something. He has preserved a people. He has his cause nearer to his own heart than we ever could. Now, that's a tremendously important lesson for us, us to learn that we dare not tremble, as it were, for the ark of God. We need to remember that God is the sovereign Lord, and he has his own cause and his own people nearer to his heart than we could ever have. And this is what Isaiah is saying. In that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob will show certain characteristics. Now, what are the characteristics of the true remnant? You will know that there is a remnant. The remnant is often, I was saying, small. And the marks of the true remnant of God's people are here. Do you notice two of them are given to us by Isaiah? One is true heart repentance. The survivors of the house of Jacob, the remnant of Israel, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And true heart 
repentance is just precisely that. No longer this, but that. It is a turning away from one pattern and one way of life and a turning to another pattern. And the other side of that true heart repentance, you see, is the other side of the evidence of the true remnant. It is not only true heart repentance, but true saving faith. They will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. So what are the great hallmarks of the true remnant? A true heart repentance and true saving faith. And in every generation and age, God has a remnant of his people. Though your people, O Israel, verse 22, be like the sand by the sea, only a remnant will return. And to these, God speaks this word of absolute assurance of their security. Verse 24, O my people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians who beat you with a rod, and lift up a club against you as Egypt did. Very soon my anger against you will end, and my wrath will be directed to their destruction. Finally, God's final triumph in verses 30, uh, 28 to 34 of this passage, where God describes the advance of Assyria like a, a, a machine of war that makes its way irresistibly towards Jerusalem. And it seems as if all hope is gone. And then, verse 33, God's final triumph is, The Lord, the Lord Almighty, will lop off the boughs with great power. The lofty trees will be felled. As I was saying, that's a description of the Assyrians. The tall ones will be brought low. He will cut down the forest thickets with an axe. Lebanon will fall before the Mighty One. Now, at the beginning of chapter 11, both Assyria and Judah are like flattened forests. Can you imagine the picture? Where there have been these mighty trees, there is nothing but a flattened forest. And if you have ever seen that kind of thing, it is a grim sight to see. Here is God. He has come down in judgment upon Judah. He has left them a flattened forest. Here is God. He has come down upon Assyria, whom he has used as an instrument in his chastising of Judah. And he has flattened them like a forest, although they seemed like an irresistible army. Now you've got nothing but the flattened forest. Not a move, not a sound of a branch waving in the wind, not a bird singing in the tree. Absolute death, as it seemed, an absolute silence. And from Assyria, you never hear another cheep again. But from Judah, just watch. From Judah, from the stump that stands in the ground where God has flattened them, from the stump there comes a stem. And it suddenly begins to grow. And as you stand watching, day by day by day, it grows greater and stronger. And then it begins to produce fruit. And life is there and it has come back. Now listen to how Isaiah puts it. Chapter 11, verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. That's the family of David, you know. Who's he talking about? Well, of course he's talking about great David's greater son. From his roots, that's the roots of Jesse, a branch will bear fruit. Now, who is this branch? To be who will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. 
doesn't your mind go right over to that moment when the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit like a dove came down and the voice said, This is my Son, my Beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the, of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. I delight to do the will of my Father. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And his coming is going to be the climax of everything that God is working out during these intervening years. God is working his purposes out as year succeeds to year, and nothing, nothing will stop him. We know that because he has worked out his purposes till the day when out of the stem of Jesse there came the one who is the true vine in whom we are made God's children. And one day God will consummate and finalize and complete all that he has been doing all through history by the return in glory of our Lord Jesus Christ when what we are going to read of next is going to take place and the triumphs of our Lord Jesus Christ will not only affect God's people but will affect the whole of the creation. So can you take up out of these verses of Isaiah's prophecy this glorious reality that at the center of history there is a sovereign God whose purposes are being worked out day by day, come what may, and the greatest powers that the universe knows cannot stand against him. And all his purposes center in Jesus Christ. He is the key to history. He is the one on whom God would focus all our attention. And we need to have our attention on him. Because one day the whole universe will bow before him and discover that he is history's key and history's center. And the whole earth will glory in all that he is. Let's pray together. We bow to worship you, our great God and Father, for the glories of all that you are, for the mystery of your wisdom, for the assurance that you are working throughout history and in our own generation. Keep us, we pray, with our eyes on your sovereign glory and on your peerless Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to whom with you and the Holy Spirit we gladly give all the honor and praise, now and forevermore. Amen.